guys, welcome back to Beautifully Bookish Bethany, where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. Subscribe for more bookish videos, and don't forget to hit that notification bell if you want to be notified every time I release a new video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I read in the month of March. <music> If you're new to my wrap-ups, the way that I always do this is I start off by talking about my stats for the month, and then I talk about all of the books that I read starting with my DNFs, or books that I did not finish, my lowest rated books moving up to my highest rated books. Some of the books that I read this month I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up, which I will link up above if you want to check that out. So for those books, I will just be telling you the title and the star rating. If you want to hear more in-depth reviews on the 13 books I read in the first half of the month, check out that video. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my statistics for March. In March, I read 27 books for a total of 9,890 pages. And that number does include my audiobooks. This month, considering everything that's going on and the fact that we live in New York City, audiobooks have been a significant part of my reading. They're always a pretty big part, but I feel like maybe more this month. I don't know, maybe not, but it's it's been fairly significant. In terms of some of my other statistics, this month I DNF'd one book, which is pretty good. I think last month I had four DNFs, this month I only had one. I did not read any translated fiction. I read one graphic work, and I read two books by indie authors. And 14 of the things that I read this month were either ARCs or books that were sent to me for review. The other 13 were books that were just on my physical TBR, or books that I was interested in reading for other reasons. In terms of age breakdown, I am continuing on with this trend of 2020 where I read significantly more adult books than YA, which is interesting because last year it was really 50-50. This month it's changed quite a bit and I'm okay with that. In March I read 17 books targeted at an adult audience, 8 books targeted at a YA audience, and 2 books targeted at a middle grade audience. Like I said in March I did listen to quite a few audiobooks, so let's talk about my audio statistics. In March I listened to 12 audiobooks, and 9 of those are what I term shelf, which means that they were books that I had on my physical TBR shelf, either as finished copies or as ARCs, and I moved them off my physical TBR through audio. In terms of where those audiobooks are coming from, as usual, the bulk of them were coming from my library. Seven of my audiobooks were from the library, two were from Scribd, three were from Audible, and this month I did not listen to any books from the Penguin Random House Volumes app where I get review copies, or from Libro FM where I get influencer copies. In terms of publication dates, I thought this was interesting. I had a couple of books that were published earlier. Usually many of the books I read are much more recent, but this month I had a book that I read that was published in 1939, one from 1975, and one from 1997. Those were the three oldest ones. Then seven of the books I read were published between 2008 and 2018. Five books were published in 2019, so last year, and 12 of the books that I read were 2020 titles, so new front list titles. I just have found that to be interesting to look at lately. Next let's talk about genre. Continuing with my other 2020 trend, which might be contributing to the fact that I'm reading more adult fiction, my most read genre for the month was romance. 11 of the books that I read were romance, and breaking this down a little bit, one of those was speculative romance, six were contemporary romance, and four were historical romance. My next most read genre, unsurprisingly, is fantasy. I read seven fantasy books in March. I also read two nonfiction, two contemporary fiction, two sci-fi, one historical fiction, one horror, and one mystery. Okay, moving on, let's look at star ratings. Uh, this was a really interesting month. I didn't have much that was particularly low rated. Everything that I read was either good or great, but it's pretty balanced within where those ratings are. So let's take a look at this. This month I did not have any books at one star, one and a half stars, or two stars, which is pretty cool. I had one book that I gave two and a half stars, six books got three stars, two books got three and a half stars, six books got four stars, 
three books got four and a half stars, six books got five stars, and three books got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, six stars means that it is a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. So it's kind of interesting. It's like one, six, two, six, three, six, three. So like the numbers are just kind of interesting this month. Um, so those are my stats. Let's go ahead and talk about all of the books. Like I said earlier, 13 of these books were books that I talked about in detail in my mid-month wrap-up. So if you want to hear more about those books, if I say they were in my mid-month wrap-up, check out that video for more in-depth reviews on those books. But with that said, let's go ahead and start with my one DNF of the month. Okay, so this was kind of a bummer. I really wanted to be into this because this is the second book that I have tried from these authors because I have friends who really love them, but I've come to the conclusion that they are just not for me. Uh, this is Daughter from the Dark by Marina and Sergei Diachenko. So this is translated from Russian. They are authors working in, I think, Ukraine, I think is where they're from. And I know some of my friends really, really love their books. I tried Vita Nostra and I DNF'd it and I thought, well, maybe this would be a better fit for me. And I read some and I just, it, it's just not the thing for me. And I think what it is, is that I have a hard time reading very much gritty, realistic, fiction. I do understand that they have fantastical elements in their books, but they feel too grounded in reality for that to be enough for me to feel like it's escapist. And there were just some things that I wasn't enjoying reading about in here, like a child being mistreated. And the thing is, if I'm going to put myself through reading that because it's something I don't particularly like reading, there has to be something else about the story that's really hooking me in. And this was just not a story I was enjoying reading. I don't think it's poorly written. I certainly understand why there are people who love this and love them, but I just think the conclusion is they are not the writers for me. So I will probably not be trying anything else from them in the future. Um, this was the second of theirs I've tried. I've DNF'd both, just not my cup of tea, so. Oh well. This month I had one book that I gave two and a half stars. I actually originally gave it three stars and then after talking about it in my mid-month wrap-up decided to drop it to two and a half stars and that is The Rosie Project by Graham Simpson. So if you want to hear my thoughts on that go ahead and check out that video. Moving on let's talk about my three star reads. This month I had six of them and two of them are books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Hearts on Hold by Cherish Reed and Ogre Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. I also gave three stars to two books in the same series that I read this month, so I thought I would just share them together. They are American Sweethearts and American Fairy Tale by Adriana Herrera. These are in the same series. This is book two, this is book four. I definitely read them out of order. This was one that I had for review, and then this was one that I just had on my TBR, and I got an audiobook from my library. So I thought I would talk about both of them. So what's interesting is in both cases, there were things that I really, really loved about the books, and those things were similar. In both cases, I love that we have people of color, men of color getting a happily ever after. I love that they talk about big issues like social justice and racism and consent and boundaries in relationships and white passing privilege. There's a lot of like richness in here. I also really, really love the friendship relationships and the family relationships. They're very, very rich. Um, however, in both cases, I didn't love the romances. They were fine. They weren't bad, but I just, they weren't quite my cup of tea. And I think it's because in both cases they are using tropes that are less my favorite. So in American Fairy Tale, this is a hookup to lovers scenario. Male, male romance. I just, I, I don't love hookup to lovers as a trope. Like it's a pretty hard sell for me. I'm kind of a slow burn romance type of girl. And so jumping into a graphic sex scene almost immediately with a stranger is just like uh, not my cup of tea. I know your mileage on this is going to vary. Not everybody feels that way. But I think because of that, because it was using that trope and because it felt sort of insta lovey to me almost to make up for that maybe where like the deeper feelings grew so quickly between these guys. I just wasn't completely sold on it. It wasn't bad. It was fine. There's a lot that I really like about what she's doing here, but for me this one was three stars. American Sweethearts is a second chance romance about childhood best friends and young lovers who finally sort of come back together after many years and a fraught relationship. This is another one that is always a little bit of a hard sell for me just because I think if you keep getting back together and breaking up. Maybe there's a reason that you're breaking up and maybe you shouldn't be together. And I wasn't entirely sold on it being the healthiest thing for this couple to be together in the end. 
Um, I think that the guy, Juan Pablo, changed quite a lot and we definitely see an arc of growth for him in the story where he's gone to therapy and he's grown and I think that's great but the girl Priscilla I did not see that with and I'm not sure I don't know so I was like not entirely sold on it so in both cases um I like a lot of what she's doing here I like a lot of the like friendships and the side characters and the messaging but the romances in both cases were fine but I didn't love them. Part of it like I said maybe the tropes and so I'm probably gonna read the other two books in the series as well and see if I get on better with them depending on what tropes those follow so we'll see. But um, if those things don't bother you I think these are well worth picking up and I think she's doing some really interesting things in adult romance. I also gave three stars to And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. This was the pick for my Patreon book club in March. We voted on a mystery novel and it was kind of fun because we read this and then we did a live watch together of the second half of the 2016 miniseries and that was super interesting. It was really fun to see similarities and differences and where they made changes for the televised version of it that was pretty cool. So this was a little bit of a mixed bag for me. Um, I know this is one of her most famous mysteries. Um, Agatha Christie is kind of the queen of mystery and this is the book that I read that was published in 1939. And I will say I really enjoyed my experience of reading it. I know that it probably wouldn't be for everyone. It's a slower paced kind of moody story that's very character driven which I enjoy. I was really into reading classics when I was a teenager and so this reminds me of the mood of that. It felt very cozy to me despite all of the people getting murdered. The mystery was interesting. It was a lot of characters to keep track of. It's like 10 different people and um, I had to keep flipping back to where the character introductions in the first part of the book just to like remember who everybody was and I think because I kept flipping back that also made it easier for me to narrow down who the killer actually was and I had it narrowed down to two people one of which was right. So I think the mystery was pretty good not like the most exciting one that I've read and you know like I said it's a lot to keep track of with all of the different characters and I think a lot of the other people who read it were like I don't know who is who I can't keep track of this so that is one downside to this book. The other thing about this is I kind of went on a Wikipedia deep dive on the history of this book and its original title as it was published in the UK and the way that it was kind of like casually racist and some of that was changed for the US version but I think reading most of this knowing that framed parts of my experience and I don't know like and I think guess she's kind of known for this of like casual racism and anti-semitism in her books. There is some low-key anti-semitism in here as well um, so you can like look into that if you want to know, um, but yeah, so I don't know. It was like a mixed bag, but I did enjoy the experience of reading it. I ended up giving this one three stars and I thought the mini series was done really well and I think everybody enjoyed that who was part of the watch party for that. So that was pretty cool. And the final book that I gave three stars to this month was Red Hood by Alana K. Arnold. This is a weird book. It's a very weird book and I know she's kind of known for writing weird things. I read Damsel by her last year and absolutely loved it. I know that was a really controversial one and so I went into this really excited because I knew it was like a loose feminist retelling of Red Riding Hood but this was not what I expected and I'm still like not sure how I feel about it. There are some things about this that I like that I like some of what she's doing. I don't know that I love some of the creative choices that were made here. One thing that's very strange about it is it's written in second person, which is sort of like choose your own adventure books where you're in the head of the character. So you look out the window and you see a wolf or whatever, like that's second person. And um, that is particularly odd and unsettling in this case because you're in the head of a 16 year old girl who is getting her period for the first time, who is exploring her sexuality for the first time and in like graphic detail and on the one hand I like the fact that this is normalizing periods and period blood and menstruation and talks about it quite frankly. I also like that it's normalizing sort of safe sex in a healthy consensual relationship. However, especially as an adult reader, it is very weird and awkward to be like 
in the head of this character experiencing these things. There's also like all the trigger warnings for this basically and I know that it's dealing with like gaslighting and sexual assault and and parts of it I think are done well. Other things especially with the ending I'm less sure of especially with this being a YA book. I don't know like I don't know how I feel about this book. It's really complicated. There's more to it. So if you want to check out my Goodreads review, my Goodreads is always linked down below and that goes into a little bit more detail about what's in this book and things I liked, things I was uncomfortable with. Um, one other thing, and this is kind of a side plot point, but it was something that I found to be really uncomfortable, is that it, it kind of is promoting this idea that it was the correct and right choice for a character, not the main character, but another character to get an abortion without talking to her spouse about it. Um, and I get this thing of like, oh, well, like it's your body so you can choose. But also like if you're married, the conversation about whether you're going to have a family or grow your family is like, a joint decision that's like something you should talk about together and I was like deeply uncomfortable with the way that that was portrayed um so yeah there's a lot of things I don't know I ended up landing on three stars you know read up on it see if it's your cup of tea <laughs> and like some people love this other people are probably gonna hate this. I had very mixed feelings about it. This month I had two books that I rated three and a half stars and one of those I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is The Beauty of Darkness by Mary E. Pearson. I also gave three and a half stars to Magic Burns by Alona Andrews. This is book two in the Kate Daniels series which I'm finally trying to continue on with. I really like Kate Daniels as a character. I really like this sort of post-apocalyptic magical Atlanta that the authors have created. I found the sort of smaller mystery plot arc of the story to be a little less compelling than the last one, but I still enjoyed my time with it. Not like a new all-time favorite book, but I like the characters, I like the setting, and I do want to keep reading, so I gave this one three and a half stars. Then I gave six books four stars, and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Storm Rise by Jillian Boehm and A Phoenix First Must Burn, 16 Stories of Black Girl Magic, Resistance, and Hope, edited by Patrice Caldwell. I also gave four stars to The Sea Glass Cottage by Ray Ann Thane. This one was sent to me for review by Harlequin Publicity Team, and I really enjoy this. It's a cozy, small-town women's fiction with romantic plot points to it that follows three generation of women with trauma that they're facing from their past and hidden secrets and I just I really enjoyed it if you like this sort of thing I think it's really good I think this is also set in the same small seaside town as some of her earlier books that she's written and I just I really liked it it was like a nice cozy read which was sort of what I was wanting this month for part of the time um, I think some people will find the teenager because one of the perspectives is a teenage girl who's like 15 and she's, you know, some people will probably find her annoying and maybe she is, but she's like 15 and she's dealing with trauma and she's, you know, it, it's fine. Um, I wasn't really bothered by that. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was great. And, uh... Yeah, four stars. I also gave four stars to Neanderthal Seeks Human by Penny Reed. This was gifted to me by my friend Mara over books like Whoa, and I'm glad I finally got around to reading it. It's kind of an odd book. It's really interesting. Um, it's fun and I don't think is meant to be taken too seriously, which is good, I guess, because if it was, it would feel very problematic. You're all in the head of this girl who's kind of quirky and geeky and a little bit socially awkward, and she's like into math and numbers and random trivia, and it's her developing this romance with this guy who's kind of dangerous and has a past and isn't necessarily the best guy, but she's just so like oblivious to most of his bad behavior. It makes it work. I don't know, like if it was, I don't know why it works for her and it's fun and silly and like poking fun at some of these more problematic tropes I think. Um, things that I'm like this really should bother me because this in real life would not be okay but because it's got this light humorous tone and you're always in her head 
somehow it works. I don't know. It's an interesting, it's a very interesting book. One thing about this too is there's not any explicit sex in here. So if you're looking for a romance book to try and that's something you want, this might be a good option for you. Um, yeah, I like I enjoyed this. I would probably read more from this author. It's just very different from anything else that I've read, but it was entertaining. I also gave four stars to The Honey Don't List by Christina Lauren. And this was an e-arc that I had out from NetGalley. I ended up really enjoying it. I wasn't sure what to think. This was my second book by them. And I didn't get along as well with um, The Honeymooners or The Unhoneymooners. This one I liked. It definitely doesn't read as much like a romance as it does women's fiction. And I wasn't sure how I felt about it for the first part of the book, but by the end I was pretty invested and I thought that the arc of it and the way it wrapped up was really interesting. The couple that it's kind of following are the assistants to the celebrity couple that are known for doing like home makeovers and making furniture and design and stuff. And this deals with like toxic workplace environments and I, I think it's really interesting. I think it's done well. I don't think it's as much of a romance and or a romantic comedy is what I was expecting like I didn't necessarily find it to be funny but I did like it and I liked where it went and the way that it wrapped up plot arcs um, so I ended up giving this one four stars I think it's worth picking up and the final book that I gave four stars to this month was Shogun by James Clavell wow this is a beast of a book it is well over a thousand pages long and I listened to it on audio and I think it took me like almost two weeks to get through it but I was surprised at how much I liked this. This was one of my patron picks. A patron who won this raffle I do monthly got to pick a book that she wanted me to read and review and that was the one that she picked. It's one of her favorite books and um, I really ended up liking it. It is very slow and very character driven with a lot of historical information about feudal Japan. It's not a perfect book but it's got really, really interesting complex characters. It's an epic historical fiction that follows the English captain of a ship who ends up kind of stranded on Japan and getting sucked into their local political intrigue. But he doesn't end up really being the main character or the hero of the story. Um, the focus ends up being more on some of these Japanese characters. And probably my favorite character is this guy named Toronaga, who is this absolutely fascinating, cunning, like, Slytherin sort of guy. Um, yeah, I really ended up liking it a lot. It's very interesting. It's very soapy and melodramatic. It feels a little bit like soap opera-ish by the end of it, but it is long. It's character driven. It's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but I liked it. I gave it four stars. Then I gave three books four and a half stars and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those are A Little Light Mischief by Kat Sebastian and Branded by Fire by Nalini Singh. I also gave four and a half stars to Indiscreet by Mary Balog. I didn't expect to like this as much as I did. I had picked this up kind of on a whim because I'd never read anything by her. She's kind of a, in some ways, classic historical romance author and I thought I should read something by her and then I ended up getting this on audio through Audible Escape so I listened to it and I think it was very ahead of its time in terms of some of the things it was dealing with. This is for sure not like a light and frothy historical romance which is usually what I go to them for. This is a little bit heavier and I think you have to not take it as if she's saying that everything that happens in here is good or romantic, but as a commentary on issues that weren't getting talked about in the same way in like 1997. It's very ahead of its time in terms of thinking about issues like the nuances of consent and gaslighting and victim blaming. And I think it's really, really interesting. She explores those issues as they may have been faced by women during this time period, but in ways that still feel relevant. So I was surprised at how much I liked this. I do think don't go in expecting to like love the hero the whole time or that all of it is supposed to be romantic. I don't think that's the point. I think it is commenting on the realities of what those things are and how messed up society can be, how misogynistic it can be. Um, but I really, really liked it. It follows a woman who is a widow who teaches music to the local lord's children and the lord's twin brother comes into town and meets her and decides to ask her to be his mistress so he can have a little fun while he's in town and she refuses. Um, and things kind of go from there. I don't want to like spoil the plot exactly but 
I think this is very, very good. I gave it four and a half stars. I really liked it. I definitely will be reading more from Mary Balog in the future. And I was impressed. Like this was not stuff that people were talking as much about during that time period. I've seen some reviews where people are like horrified at what happens in here and like, this is terrible. How could she think this is romantic? And I'm like, no, she doesn't. Like, I don't think it's supposed to be that she thinks what happens is okay. It reads to me like commentary on it. And so it was a pleasant surprise. Um, so yeah, four and a half stars. I really liked it. Okay, moving on, let's talk about my five star reads. I had six of them and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Salty Bittersweet by Myra Cuevas, Noisemakers, 25 Women Who Raised Their Voices and Changed the World, a graphic collection, All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson, and The Test by Sylvain Nouvelle. I also gave five stars to The Governess of Air by Courtney Milan. This is a little novella. It's a prequel to her brother's Sinister series, and this is another one that I listened to on Audible Escape. I really, really liked this a lot. It's another one where I just thought it was handling issues so well and just did a great job of developing relationships and characters in a pretty short number of pages. I understand that like this is also not everybody's cup of tea but I really liked it. It's about a young woman who had been a governess and is determined to have retribution from her employer who kind of ruined her basically and the guy whose nickname is Wolf who's like his handler of situations who is supposed to just take care of this woman for him. And um, this does deal with sexual assault and trauma. There's a scene in here that I absolutely love that is this sort of redemptive scene of her having the opportunity to take back control of her own sexuality when something was forced upon her, giving an opportunity for what it looks like for consent and consent being sexy. And um, I just really loved it. I thought it was great. I gave it five stars. It was short and sweet and really good. And then finally, I also gave five stars to Bonds of Brass by Emily Skrutsky. I'll put a picture of the final cover here so you can see it. This one is coming out really soon, in just like a couple weeks, I think, and I loved it. It's the first book in a sci-fi trilogy that centers a queer relationship, but it's so much more than that. It's so smart with angst and political intrigue and moral dilemmas, and she just does such a good job with it. It's such a page turner as well. The first part of it I couldn't put it down. It dragged a tiny bit in the middle but barely and then the last part of it just completely sucked me in. I can't wait for book two. And it's kind of a politically star-crossed lover's story and it's real interesting. So the main character is this guy whose world had been sort of torn apart when he was orphaned at 10 years old when these colonialist invaders came in and decimated his city and their government and took over. He was on the streets for five years and then eventually joined the Imperial Military Academy and is now a promising young pilot serving the people who basically took over and destroyed his homeland. And he has a best friend who he also maybe has some low-key developing attraction to who is threatened and he ends up saving his life only to find out that his best friend is secretly the Imperial heir. His mother was the person who ordered this attack that destroyed the friend's life. But they have feelings for each other, they have to go on the run together, lots of things happen. It's great. It's really, really great. So I gave it five stars. Highly recommend checking it out. And then this month I am happy to report that I actually had three books that I gave six stars, which means they're favorites of the year or favorites of all time. One of them I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up, and that is Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare. Kind of surprisingly, I also gave six stars to Tempest by Beverly Jenkins. I freaking loved this book. Um, one of my favorite romances that I've read in a long time, I already knew I liked Beverly Jenkins. She writes incredible historicals that are heavy on history, but guys, this was so good. It involves a strong, sassy, mail order bride and the book begins with her accidentally shooting her husband to be in the shoulder and it goes from there. It made me laugh out loud, it had me on the edge of my seat, it was heartwarming and funny and sweet and just good. This was like the perfect romance for me. Um, I loved it, I loved their relationship. It's also probably one of the steamiest Beverly Jenkins books but the characters in this are just so 
good. Um, and he's a widow with a young girl. It's just, it's wonderful. Really, really wonderful. One of my favorite romances I've read in a while. I would highly recommend it. So um, yeah, new fave for me. It's definitely going to be going on my favorites shelf. And then the final book I gave six stars to this month is an arc of a book that is coming out in June, I believe. This is Where Dreams Descend by Janella Angelis. I will put a picture of the final cover here. This is being pitched as Moulin Rouge meets Phantom of the Opera, and I see where they're coming from, but it's also very much its own thing. I loved this book. You will be getting an in-depth spoiler-free review from me eventually, um, but for now what I'll say is just that this ticked so many of my boxes. I don't know if this will work for everybody, but it had all the things that I love in books. It has a fierce and complex female character. It has secrets to be uncovered and a mysterious ancient city. It's got magical trials. It's got fighting the patriarchy. It's got a angsty love triangle with a creepy sort of darkling-like person. She also does this thing that's like one of my favorite things where she seeds tiny little hints throughout the book that just like are intriguing and give you a tiny bit of information, not a lot, not enough to give it away, but if you put the clues together you can learn a little bit more about the world and what's really going on. Susan Denner does this, Renee Audier did this in The Beautiful, I love it, I think it's so smart. She is a debut author, she's Filipino-American, and I loved it. It's so good. I'm definitely going to be wanting a finished copy for myself and I can't wait for book two. Oh my gosh, that ending. Um, it's great. So yeah, highly recommend. Real good. There you have it. Those are the 27 books that I read in the month of March. Some really good ones and some that really surprised me by how much I enjoyed them and kind of a nice mix of types of books that I was reading. In general, I was having a good time with the stuff that I was picking up this month, which is part of why I only had one DNF, which is I think a good sign that I'm doing a pretty good job of picking stuff for myself. So yeah, talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about today. And for your question of the day, are there any trends that you've noticed in your reading this year starting in 2020? Like I've noticed I'm reading a lot more romance, I'm reading a lot more adult fiction, and I'm sure there are reasons for that. But tell me if you see trends in your reading. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.